Okay, so starting section three, day three. Hopefully, uh, yesterday was a bit of an eye-opener, and you feel like you kind of got uh, a little further along in your taste for what we're doing here. And today is really going to draw together the last couple of days and put a nice pretty bow on order flow for you. Okay? My expectation is that by today, and I'm not going to say that tomorrow you're going to be an expert, but by today, uh, you really understand the difference between approaching the market with a very novice, um, and I hate to use the word uneducated, but uh, we'll say lack of knowledge uh, as to uh, what's, what's realistic in the short term, uh, and begin looking at the market as a professional discretionary trader who's capable of making decisions. This is where you start to take ownership of this, okay? Um, I don't have any expectation that you're going to be calling perfect trades and, and executing everything perfectly by the end of the day, <clears throat> but the concepts should be very clear and you should understand the road that you have in front of you. Uh, at first, some of this is going to seem like, well, my gosh, how in the world am I ever going to be able to do that fast enough? And like anything, it's going to take practice. And the more time that you spend with it and the more that you engage the market, uh, particularly in simulated trading, and we'll give you a, uh, a path to go down for getting very familiar with the software as well. Uh, and, until you really spend the time with it, you know, there's a lot of things that look good on paper and you just can't do uh, in real time. And I assure you, nothing that we're going to present you here can't be accomplished. We do it every day, and it makes all the difference in the world when you can make the decision whether or not you, you as the individual, can afford the risk or are willing to risk for the, the potential reward. Okay, so uh, what that should signal to you is that in the future, as you become an accomplished trader here, I don't have the expectation that everything that I do, you're going to do. And I'm certainly not going to do everything that you're going to do. Uh, we all make decisions based on the, the things that we're comfortable with, the risk that we're comfortable with, and uh, the, the process is to have a strict guideline for how to make those decisions so that you can replicate and so that you can correct errors. When we start talking about actually placing trades using the order flow, okay, just your basic limit order or market order, okay, just getting into a trade, the process that we're going to use as discretionary traders is not a signal on the chart. Okay? It's not a computer telling us uh, buy here, sell here. Okay? While we are gaining insight from the information at hand, what we're looking to do first is understand before we ever put on any, any risk into the market, where do we have a logical stop for this trade? I have to associate the very first thing, which is what's my potential downside. Okay? I need to know what my downside is prior to ever putting anything at risk, because otherwise I'll find myself, uh, you know, putting stops on the on you know the high of the day, you know, something like that. Instead of thinking, well, why not go just a little bit beyond the high of the day in case we go up and retest that? You know, just some very basic things like that. We're going to talk about generating probable targets. Okay? And as you begin this process, I don't have any expectation that you're trading 4 or 10 or 12 or, or 20 contracts. Okay? So initially that may just be a target, something close by. Right? And it may be the process of finding several. But we have to be able to do those two things so that we can assess the required risk. Okay? You don't put on a trade because the computer tells you to. You put on a trade because you've made the determination that the potential profit is greater than that of the, the downside risk, and that falls into something that you can accept. All right? If you can't take a, a two-point stop, and that's not in your trading strategy and trading plan, but your entry that you're given dictates that you're going to have to, you can't take that trade. Guess what? Sorry, you can't. That's how you become a professional is making those decisions and standing by it. I don't care how good it ends up being. You can't chase into it. You can't take a larger stop than you can afford. Why? Because we're going to be wrong sometimes, guys. Nothing is, is 100%. There's no certainties in this. And we're going to be wrong. 
And as I said yesterday, one of the biggest things that we, that we have to come up with is whether we're making bad choices or taking a bad trade. And if we can come up with these three things, we can figure that out. You know, Am I putting myself into something that is bigger than, than I need to? Am I risking more than I should? Okay. And once we're in that trade, if we determine that we can get into that trade, <clears throat> then we have to be proactive about managing it. We can't just simply s step back and take the passive role of the novice trader and say, well, I'm in it now. I hope it works out. <sighs> yeah, that's not going to work. Okay? It's not going to work. We have tools and we have information at hand to make this a smooth process that you can approach the same way every time. Okay? So if something puts me into a trade where I've determined a stop and I've determined a probable target and I've assessed that risk to reward and I've found my entry and the, the pattern that I'm utilizing to get into the market exists and I get in and then suddenly the condition changes. Does it make any sense for me to just say, well, I told myself that I would, I would never take more than a bigger than a two-point stop, so I'm just going to let this run to two points. <laughs> you might. I'm never going to do that. No way. It's a killer. Okay, I'm going to be proactive every step of the way because if the condition changes and I can limit that to a two-tick stop, okay, no problem. What if I can take uh, half a point out of the market because I'm profitable, but I can see that everything's starting to work against me? Should I take half a point profit and walk away and live, to, live for the next trade? Or should I cross my fingers and hope because some piece of software told me that, it, that the trade looked right earlier that it's going to work out. And we have to be proactive about it. This is where you take ownership and you start to say, listen, I understand why I got into this trade and it no longer exists. Okay? We're going to discuss the, the algorithmic process that goes on in the software. A lot of you had questions about what's gray and green and red and all these things. We're going to discuss that today. We're also going to talk about the trade tracking technology. This is an option that a lot of you uh, have opted for. I highly recommend it if you're trading with NinjaTrader. It opens up a whole different world to be able to see where your trade is in the flow of orders. And it's just a, it's a, it's a very unique way of looking at things, uh, taking yourself away from the chart and away from the, the one piece of information and focusing on where your trade is. And I mean your trade, not mine, not somebody else in the room. Who cares what somebody else is doing? This affects your account, not theirs. Right? So as I said, you begin to take ownership. And when you're tracking your trade, that is ownership. You're making those decisions based on what you see where you are. And then we'll talk about a basic strategy to, to begin approaching this because there's going to be a learning curve here for getting trades executed properly, uh, assessing the risk to reward, uh, things like that. And, and we have to get you to a point where we can limit your risk as much as possible. And this, this strategy may not be what you end up trading with in 10 days, okay? but it's meant to get you through the process of, of, of getting that fir those first baby steps of understanding what it means to execute from market-generated data. Okay? Now, the, when we start talking about stops, up until this point, we've ha basically had just a lot of information about order flow and how, how, how uh, trade comes into the market. But as we move on into tomorrow, we're going to start talking about a much larger vision of the market, getting a sense of the more macro aspects of, uh, of things. And you know, a big piece of that is just being aware of previous price valuations. And what I mean by that is that if, in this case, the buyers drove the market up to 1036 previously, and we see a strong rejection of that, meaning there was tremendous responsive selling that went on, followed by sellers initiating trade. It's an obvious reversal here. Okay? That previous valuation there is an indication to me that that's not going to be easy to trade through. Now, that certainly doesn't mean that every high or every low on the chart is always going to hold. And we know that not to be true. We know that we can expand the market by two ticks. 
by 10 ticks, by 25 points. Okay, but we have to be aware of things that have happened around where we're trading. Because if there was a valuation process there before, there probably is now. And we talked the other day about somebody protecting their position. And there's a sense when you say something like that, that that means that the sellers at 1036 will now sell again because they don't want anybody to trade through there. Well, while that might be true, okay, the most important piece of the puzzle is that those shorts that are still in the market from 36, from the previous day or whenever this is, don't simply say, okay, well, that didn't pan out. I'm going to start coming off of this position because those shorts become, become buy orders, which then shifts the overall dynamic of the market, and we can very easily trade through something. Okay? So we're going to be looking at ways to value the market, and I'm going to give you several that I utilize, and that's really going to be the focus of tomorrow's class. And as that starts to come together for you, where you get beyond the idea of things like pivot points that are um, high, low, close, divided by three, something arbitrary like that. You know, what is that? What? You know, why, why would I be interested in that? Okay, when you get beyond that and you start to realize that the market is going to react at places where it's reacted before. There's going to be, and, and think of it as a, you know, if I, if I tried to explain this to a five-year-old, he'd get it right immediately the first shot. Okay? You say, this is where the sellers came in the last time and look where they made money. If you had a million dollars and I told you you had to sell the market, where would you do it? I'd do it the exact same place that the guy did it last time and made money, right? five-year-old would get that. But for some reason, we can't. We don't understand that. We go, oh, I don't know, is it going to be, is it going to be? We overthink everything. It's not important that we try and short there. It's important that we pay attention, right? And so I'm not going to be interested in putting my stop somewhere where I am looking at very obvious support or resistance, okay? I have to get outside of those numbers. Right? I just can't logically do that. Now, that could be on a very small scale where we look at a rotation and we say, okay, well, we see where the, where the buyer failed and where the market's been you know, trading back down, and if we get back on top of that high volume, then this is, this is going to be garbage. So we you know, might use a stop just outside of the top of a period. Okay? Or if I'm looking at the chart and I'm trading off of, off of a, a pattern where I'm looking at the previous day's high and I'm saying, we're going to trade up to this and test it, and I get a nice responsive selling pattern, Maybe it's a point inside of the previous day's high. Well, I'm not going to use a one-point stop. That would be right on the previous day's high. Right? And very often, we reject right in front of it. One tick, two ticks, three ticks in front of the previous day's high or low. Okay? So it doesn't make any sense for me to, to have the, the mentality of, well, my spreadsheet says that I have to use a one-point stop, and so I'm going to use a one-point stop no matter where my entry is. Right? We're going to learn to read the order flow and to read the chart so that we don't do stuff like that. Okay? It's an expensive way to spend your day to get stopped out. And somebody a couple of days ago said, God, how does, how does the market always know where my stop is? A lot of times my response to that is, do you know where your stop is? Okay? And it's not to say that every time you're making a foolish decision. I'm just saying most people don't have a clue. They think of it in terms of dollars and cents and a numerical value, and that's it. And they don't bother to look around to see what's going on there. You know, is this exactly where the market maker is likely to drive back and stop somebody out? You know, if I see a lot of trade stuck at the top, is, it might, is my stop exactly on two points from, the, from where the bulk of that volume is? Because they're going to get stopped out. 70 or 80% of the time, they're going to get stopped out. So if my stop is with theirs, <laughs> I've just put myself in that 90% category of, of traders who lose. Okay? So as we go through the exercises today, we're going to talk about just getting a little bit logical. All right? You've got to use your noodle here. You know, and we're all going to do it. I do it all the time. Sometimes you know, I get into a perfect trade and I say, this is where my stop is. And I completely, completely tune out the fact that it's something substantial. And it'll tick right to, right to my stop and then we'll see it expand again. Okay? It just it happens, and you've got to be aware of where your stops are. And so that's the first step of any trade. Before you can get into anything, 
you have to say, what is my expectation if this goes against me? How far is it going to go against me? And is it reasonable for me to get on the other side of that? Or is it like, um, it shouldn't go any more than three ticks further than where we are. And if it does, it's going to run up another five points. Guess what? Four ticks stop, right? If you've got a spread of five points, you're not going to hold it for five points. You're going to take a very, very, very small stop. Three or four ticks, great. Those are perfect. That's what you want. That's why you study the order flow. You look for those opportunities where your downside is nothing. Right? Nothing at all. So we just have to be logical about it, and that's the first step is just realizing things like that. So if we understand where our stop is, what we now need to do is come up with some sort of part. What is it likely to do if this trade works out? What am I up against? What's in the way? All right. Well, what's, what is likely to give me pause? And I'm going to look at the order flow. All right. I'm going to look and see where trade was executed. What happened? Remember, what we're, what we're interested in here is who's profitable and who's not. Okay. Who's profitable and who's not. So in this particular example, if we look at what's traded on the way up here, we would obviously say that at some point this was buyers initiating trade, right? It obviously opened at the low and traded straight up. And at some point around where the, the 1030 line is, obviously they don't correlate exactly with a point spread, but where the 1030 line is, it's very high volume there in comparison to the rest of the period. I would venture to say that at some point, this was the, the volume cluster of this. Would you guys agree or disagree? Okay. So if this was the volume cluster and we accelerated beyond it by more than four price levels, we would then associate that as buyers initiating trade, correct? Okay, so if we have buyers initiating trade from this area and then we trade up several more points and we see that it becomes a responsive selling pattern and we want to determine a short, would it not make sense that the most difficult aspect of this is going to be trading back through the last place where buyers initiated trade? Agree or disagree? Okay, so it's all right in front of me. The hardest part of this is going to be getting back through the 30s. So it makes sense for me to plan a target there. Okay? Now, as we begin, we may actually be looking at this as just that's the target. I mean, a real like my orders there, okay? because we're going to have to take some baby steps into this. But as we get better and better at this, don't you feel that you'd, you would eventually be able to look at the order flow forming as we get down to 30 and make that decision? Do I see sellers initiating trade all the way through it, or do I see a responsive buying pattern forming? Is the commitment of traders scaring the heck out of me? Right? So I don't necessarily have to have some hard target there where I'm, I, I'm saying, absolutely, that's my hard target. Okay? But I ought to be very aware of the fact that that's the only place in the trade right now that I see an issue. That's the only place that I see this not really working out for me. Okay, So if I look at that and say, well, <clears throat> I'm going to try and get my entry as close to the high volume cluster here as possible, so I need to get filled somewhere right around where the, where the E is on the chart. I know where my stop is and I know where my target is. Does this make sense if that's all I were to get out of it? If that's all I were to get out of it, is my target better than my stop? You know, and in this case, it's a little bit better. Well, I don't know why you guys are putting no. Yeah, okay, slightly. All right. So, well, get that out of your head, guys. We missed a step here, I guess, because what I said was, 
are we going to put this in as a hard target and say, well, absolutely, that's, that's, what, that's where I'm putting in a target? Or are we going to say, look, the only thing that I see in my way is something that's a couple of points away, two points, okay? And I'm looking at the, the downside of this being a point and a half, now this, we could get down to 30 and the sellers could initiate trade and it'd be fabulous, right? Maybe this runs for 10 points. What if my target is really down at 25? All I'm trying to do is, is say, when I get into this trade, if the sellers actually come in, am I, am I likely to get away from this thing far enough to put me into a reasonable trade? Or is it going to be like I'm going to down tick and it's going to go two ticks down and then i got to worry about it running back up to my stop? Okay. This doesn't have to be the end of your trade. The point of it is, is that I can see right here how difficult it's going to be to move away from this. And the last place that I see buyers coming in is a couple of points away. And if my stop only needs to be a point and a half away, I'm okay with that. It works for me. Yeah, you're getting it, Eric. Yeah, Jim, I would find it very hard to get into a trade where all I did was move two or three ticks from my entry and then the market just basically started holding and I have to sit there and chew my fingernails. But if I know that I can get into a trade where a couple of points away is where all that's going to take place, if I'm in the money two points, I can make decisions about whether or not I need to get out, get out of the trade, uh, just take my profit, hold on to it or whatever and not feel stressed out about it. But if it happens right at my entry, we've all been there. When you get into a trade and it doesn't move, isn't it exhausting? It is for me. I don't like to trade that way. <clears throat> so here's our process. Locate the stop. Locate a potential target. Assess the risk. See if we can get the entry that we need and manage the trade. Well, look what took place here. What can we assume from this other than just, it, wow, it ran down? Is anybody seeing the, the point of this, of this example? What is the second period? Classify it for me. Okay. So by saying sellers initiated trade, that means that the market traded lower with selling and found what? Some sort of temporary support, right? Where it was a little more difficult to get through. And then what? The sellers then broke through that and, and initiated enough trade to break it down, right? Anybody notice where that happened? Yeah, same exact spot. Okay, so there were decisions to be made there. But that's what we do here is make decisions. So we see this responsive selling pattern and we say, hot diggity, I want to get in. I'm in. Let's, let's do this. Where's my stop? Where's my target? Where's my entry? Okay. And then the sellers come in and they drive the market right to where your first target is. Right? That's how the market works. Are there going to be times where you get into a short and then suddenly it takes off the other direction? Yes. But for the most part, what you're going to find is that when you put on a trade, if you can identify the last place where somebody was profitable in bulk, that's going to be the hardest place for you to trade through. So you best be able to recognize whether or not that's functional for you. Now, personally, if I see the high of the day produce, or the high of the previous day, or in this case, the high of the, of the, of the same day, I guess that was the 9 o'clock high,
produce a responsive selling pattern, I'm going to short it, guys. Those are the major points that I'm looking for. I'm looking for where commercial traders are, are likely to engage the market, not a 150 tick chart or something like that that has a double top. Or I'm not interested in that. But when I see a very significant place where the last time we came up here, the buyer ran out of gas, the seller engaged the market and then drove the heck out of it, yeah, those are the kind of places I'm looking to put on a trade. And when I get the order flow to dictate that and tell me that I've got a two-point spread before I'm ever going to see any trouble, and my drawdown should be about a point and a half, I'm in. That's a beautiful opportunity for me. So our process to enter a trade. need to find a logical stop, okay? Now, when we're looking at these things in terms of uh, a single period here, we don't have the benefit of looking at a giant chart. But if we can understand what we're, what, what, what does this pattern represent here? <clears throat> Anybody? Sellers driving the market lower, high volume at the low. What do we see? Responsive buying, right? What's our assumption about responsive buying? that sellers have come into the market in, in a heavy condition at a volatile point, right? And that we, we're now trading above them. Yes, very, very well put. Trapped sellers. So what do we think would happen if we started trading back down below the 3138? Would that change our, our interpretation of this? Possibly, yeah, right? because those guys wouldn't be trapped, they'd be profitable. So does it stand to reason that I really need to have a stop much bigger than the than below where the responsive selling effort and responsive buying effort is? Not really, right? Doesn't make sense. I mean if the sellers come back in and start driving that thing, it's going to be sellers initiating trade, right? So I gave you a very specific example on the last one, looking at the previous high of the day. Okay, and a lot of times we're going to be trading off of, and we're also talking about you know something that's against the momentum here. But you know for the most part we're going to be trading very significant price levels, where we expect the the, the buyer or seller to come in with force because I want to trade with the big guy. I don't want to trade with the the little guy who's scalping all the time. All right. So for the most part, we ought to be able to come up with a logical target based on something else on the chart. But intuitively, we should understand that if this is responsive buying and this is going to hold, if I'm executing a good trade from a logical point, I can't now see this thing start driving back through there. It would, it would completely negate everything that we've just come up with, saying that these sellers are trapped. If the sellers are profitable, we're done. Okay? So for the most part, we're looking for stops beyond where the volume cluster is. Now, obviously, you're going to start off with hard stops. Okay? You're going to trade with hard stops. It makes everybody feel warm and fuzzy, and I get it. Okay? You're going to start off and say, well, I, this is a five tick stop, and that's what I'm using. And you're going to find that every now and then your stop is just touched. It happens to all of us. doesn't matter how good of a trader you are. Okay. But for the most part, if you're trading on it with a stop on the other side of the volume cluster, that is your safety net. And if it gets accelerated through, you don't want to be in that trade. As you get more advanced, you may get better and better at reading the print and moving your stop around and adding on to positions, and, and you may choose to never do that. Okay. But all we really need to do is say, listen, if that's what I'm expecting to hold this thing up, are all these sellers that are upside down, then I don't need to have a stop two points below that. I need to have a stop right below it. Get in the habit of risking three or four ticks, maybe five ticks. Get in the habit of that. And obviously, we just want to make sure that we're not putting a stop on a major target. 
Okay, an example would be if we come up with a number. Let's say that this morning we say 25 is the number that we're looking to buy off of. All right, and it comes down and we see a responsive buying effort and it comes down to 25 quarter. Okay, and we're, God, we're just pretty dang close, right? Pretty dang close to it. If I get into a, a long because we come down to 25 quarter and I missed my target by one tick, you know, that's pretty good. You know, we, we're, we're, we're good at this. We're not perfect. We'll usually be a couple of ticks off of major targets, not much more than that. But if it comes down and it produces that, am I going to say, yeah, I'm going to put a stop on 25? No. You know, how bad would you feel? How bad would you feel if your target this morning was 25, it came down to 25 quarter, you saw the responsive buy, and then we did a double bottom and it went one tick further and stopped you out. So if you have major targets that, are, that you're using as support and resistance, always respect them because we do come down and, and double test things every now and then or move up and double test things. But for the most part, you ought to be starting this process with very small stops, very small stops. There's just no reason to risk more than that. If you get in the habit of following me, I don't, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't trade with stops. My stops are at five points. Okay, so if all you're doing is following me and saying, oh my God, where's your stop? And did you get stopped out? And blah, 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 blah. My stop's at five points, guys. That's the most that I can take as a drawdown. That's my safety net. I don't think anybody in here has ever seen me take a five-point stop. Maybe. Maybe once. Okay, so I don't trade with hard stops the same way because I'm reading the print the whole way. And usually if it goes down and touches right where I would want my stop to be, I wait for the market to lift back up a tick and I get out a little bit better than I would have if I took a hard stop. Okay, it's just, it's the development of becoming a discretionary trader. Right now, most of you probably aren't there. So don't worry about it. Put in hard stops. Ask me where it should be. I'll tell you where it should be. Uh, if you're confused about what you see, ask, 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 okay, definitely. But don't get tied up worrying about where my stop is. This is discretionary trading, and we're, we're going to have some differences. And that's a tough nut to swallow, but we have to begin taking ownership of the stuff that we do. Okay, we have to. Otherwise, it's a, well, you said this, and you did that. And, you know, I've had people come in and go, well, you're not really in that trade. Really? And I'll put my screen up. I'm really in it. Okay. I don't, there's no reason for me to yank your chain. It's not going to do any better to have you think that I'm making money and you're not. It's not going to do me any justice at all. all right? So don't get tied up in that stuff. Be smart about your position. How much can you take as a drawdown? Okay. If you can't take seven ticks, don't put on a trade with a seven tick stop. So logical stops first. Figure out where they need to be. Now we have to come up with a target. If we're looking at this, this is responsive buying, right? So at some point, the seller was initiating trade to break it down. Based on the volume in this, and we don't know anything else about it, we do not know the market depth or anything else, but could we, could we say that we could identify where probably the, the, the seller had the easiest go versus where the seller had a pretty rough go. And Eric's pretty much on it. Okay? People were asking me earlier about, Brad, I'll address your question in just a second. People were asking me earlier about uh, how do we know light trade versus heavy trade versus, you know, it's, I know you want hard numbers and you look at something and go, wow, 6,000 contracts looks like a huge amount. We just have to draw a comparison. You know, Draw a comparison. Look, Remember what we're looking for. We're not looking for a little blue line. We're looking for a cluster of volume. And every period, for the most part, will typically contain more than one unless they're very, very small. Okay? So in this case, we have to think about where the seller engaged the market. And to me, up at the top, we see the seller came in with a couple of couple of price levels of 3,000 contracts, 2971, 2973, right? Then what happened below that? 1467, look at the, look at the trade at the ask against that. 
540. Look at the next level, 11, 1100 against 798. Yeah, Eric, you're right on the money. The buyer gave up there. Okay, for all the effort that was going in with the 3,000 and the 4,200 and the 1,800 up at the top, suddenly the buyer gave up and stopped trading at the ask. <clears throat> okay, so to me, that, that indicates that up there is the last place that the seller came in. Now, is that overwhelming? I don't know. I don't have any, any real-life comparison to draw it to because we don't know what else took place this day. But given the information at hand... To me, it makes sense that this is going to be a difficult place, the only difficult place for me to get through in this. Okay? So I've got a couple of things to think about, and particularly this mostly involves when we've got responsive patterns. Okay? Mostly with a responsive pattern, there's two things that I want to think about. One, where's the last initiated trade that got us down or up to whatever point we're seeing a response off of? And the other thing I need to, to think about is if indeed all of these sellers that are trapped at the bottom do get their stops run, where is that going to put us? Right? It's going to put us a point and a half to two points away from where the bulk of trade was executed. Right? So the rotations that we typically see are going to be six to eight ticks. Right? And I don't just mean the rotation meaning the tip of the period. What I mean is when we see sellers trapped and buyers run their stops, we will see we will see the market quickly move back up. You usually we haven't in the last two days. Quickly rotate back up, create a new period and and essentially run up to the to the balance there of uh, where we would see, for example, those thirty one, thirty eight sellers trapped at the low start to come out of the market. Okay? So if I don't have a target in mind because I'm looking at it and going, it all looks so light I don't see anywhere where there was initiated trade. Okay, if, it, if that's what I see, then I have to start thinking to myself, I still need to be very aware two points off. Right? A couple of points off, I need to pay attention to what's going on. Because unless they just drive right through and run this market up, I'm going to have some trouble. Okay? So two questions here. Let me address them both before we move on any further. In the beginning, fairly tight stops based on tool is not going to greatly reduce winner potential. No. No. You're looking to you're looking to put trades on that are working, okay? And if we're if we're taking trade if we're taking tra trades that have a lousy profit potential, meaning three or four ticks away from us. We see a lot of trade that came in. That's gonna. It's a bad trade. What do we want to? What do we want to do? What's our goal here? Do we want to learn how to take great trades, or do we want to learn how to take a lot of risky trades with big stops? I want you to say hey, it's not. It's not the latter, right? We want to learn how to spot the right trades, right? Yeah, and if it's not working, get out. Okay. Uh, Johnny, your question is <clears throat> last initiated trade. Okay, and what what we've been discussing here are the you know the basics of a of a pattern. Okay, and, and what we see in this one is that the majority of trade is down at the bottom of the period. Okay, so we have something that's very heavily weighted on the bottom, and that just simply means that lifting the price up a little bit puts a lot of trade in jeopardy. Okay, but we're looking at this in hindsight and saying, well, this is where it is now. But if you can imagine the creation of this period. Obviously, it's think of it as a candlestick, and the open was up at the very top of it, right? So when we opened, we had sellers coming in and hitting the bid, and we had buyers hit, lifting the offer, hitting the bid, lifting the offer, hitting the bid, lifting the offer. There's a lot of trade up there, right? The first three or four price levels have quite a bit of trade, and then we've got kind of this spot in the middle where it's very light, and then it gets heavy down at the bottom again. Okay. Well, it's heavier on the bottom than it is on the top, but we can still see what happened on the top. At some point, that little blue line that represents the highest volume in the period was up at the top, right? And if you understand what took place here, it probably was 
a lot of trade exchanging, and then all of a sudden it popped down three or four levels. And the reason it popped down quickly was because the buyer gave up, and all the seller had to do was sell through the market depth, the demand that was there, the resting limit orders, which were probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,200 contracts, based on what I'm seeing here. Okay. And so what happened was the seller initiated enough trade to make the buyer give up and break the market down, even if it was only a point or a point and a half. Okay, so what we're, what we're saying is if we look to where the last trade of any, of any size took place, that's the last place that the seller really had to initiate trade in order to get the market to move. Does that make sense? Okay, sure. Okay, so we're going to come up with targets based on what we see in the order flow, but we also have targets based on what we expect out of the market. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about that tomorrow. Okay, and those aren't static. I mean, we come up with a plan in the morning, but we're not always that good. We have to then improve that plan as the day moves on because things may not come together. So as we were talking about in the, in the very first slide of this, just because we have an expectation that it's going to be difficult to get through there doesn't mean it's going to be impossible. I'm just telling you that I don't see any issue between uh, the high volume and you know the upper portion of this period being difficult if we have any buyers come in at all. I would venture to say they'll probably trade it up to, to those levels pretty easily, mostly because they'll be trying to stop out the shorts that came in late, but also because there's probably just not going to be anybody that's letting go of their shorts from up above yet. Right? If you're short from where the 2975 is, you're profitable. Are you going to throw that trade away now, or are you going to throw that trade away when it gets back to your entry? Probably when it gets back to your entry, right? Maybe even a little bit behind it if you're using a stop and you've taken profit and all these other things, right? So protecting those positions doesn't mean that somehow sellers are going to just start pouring on more to drive it lower. They might. But protecting that means that nobody's going to throw in the towel on their trade when they're profitable by two points. They're going to throw in their towel when they're not. So if we can trade through those levels, those stops are going to come off. And the market's likely to move a lot easier once we get through those levels. Right? Agree or disagree? Okay. So we may have a multitude of targets, and that's the way that we need to approach this, particularly if you're looking for something that really balances out risk to reward. Okay? Uh, if you look at everything as a scalp, I'm not going to tell you that it's an unsuccessful way to trade, but it's going to take some time. Okay? It's going to take some time for you, and you're going to have to get comfortable with you know, being able to use small enough stops. And a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? As soon as I put on the trade, I'm going to be stopped out. Well, then you need to come up with better entries, right? <clears throat> you need a better, better process if you're worried about it you know, moving against you because we do it all the time. Okay, so we want to have bigger targets in mind for the most part. And sometimes you won't. You know, there are times, particularly late in the day, if I take a trade late in the day, very often I'm, I'm only looking for a point or a point and a half. And I'll tell you that ahead of time before the trade's ever filled. Small target trade, you know, because I know it's going to be easy and it's going to be fast. <clears throat> so what we have to do is assess the risk, Okay. We have to look at this and say, all right, I see that there's a responsive buying pattern. I know that I can put my stop below where the heavy volume is. I know where it's going to be a little bit difficult to trade through. Okay? And so now I've got to come up with an entry because if I try and trade this from, let's say, two ticks above the, high, the, the purple line or the blue line, the high volume level, what is that going to do to my situation? If I say, well, I'm going to get in long here, and I might be able to trade through this, and i got to put a stop down here, that's not a very good plan, is it? Yeah. 
It's not. Sure. Okay. And there was a big uh, kind of conundrum on the last example because everybody said, well, God, a risk or reward, I mean, it's just slightly better and blah, blah, blah. Okay, and I get it because it doesn't look right. <laughs> but the point is, is that I'm, my expectation is that what I want to do is get into a trade and know that I've got an advantage where the market's going to move. Okay? The market's going to move and it's going to provide me with opportunity to get myself situated and look at my management and make decisions. But if I get in here and all the market does is move two ticks, I'm terrified, man. I'm biting my nails and everything else. Right? So what I need to do, is, and everybody's risk to reward is going to be a little bit different, but for me, most of the time, what I'm interested in is being able to establish the initial trade, okay? The initial piece of this. Remember, I'm not taking 100% profit at my target, and I'm not taking, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one in that sense, all right? Because I'm trading multiple contracts, and this is where multiplying things really comes into effect. Okay? But for me, for the most part, what I need to see is that my, my risk to reward on a trade is at least one-to-one, -one, okay? And you say, Jesus, I've I've done the spreadsheet and that doesn't work. How many trades do you think I'm going to take 100% of my profit out here? It's almost never going to happen. Okay. What I'm trying to do is set myself up for a process where I can move from my entry a point and a half to two points without too much trouble so that I can assess what's going on and say, yeah, I need to, I need to go ahead and take profit on this or yeah, I'm totally upside down or yeah, this really looks good so that I can move forward. All right, now that's me, and as you get better and better at this, you're going to see opportunities where you can't see anything for three points, and you're like, geez, okay. So the first thing I need to be worried about is that these guys get stopped out right here, and then they come back in and, and push it back down. So anytime you're buying off of responsive buying or you're selling off responsive selling, your first notion should be that it's going to be difficult for me to get more than a couple of points. And then I'm going to find out what happens. Okay? Because the first thing that, we're, that, that we should associate, if nothing else, is that the stops are just going to be run. I promised myself I wouldn't draw all over this. Okay? So think of it as an initial target. And what we're trying to accomplish is something where we can put ourselves at minimal risk and at least be able to get as much out of it as we're risking. Now, for you, it may be different. You may say, I want four points with a, with a three-tick stop. And I'll say, good for you, and I hope you find a couple of trades each week. If I'm looking at this, the only way that I can get into this trade with the way that I trade and the risk that I am that willing to take is that I have to get filled somewhere in these two ticks. Okay? I have to get filled here because otherwise I start getting upside down. And I may be able to take one trade where I'm upside down a little bit, but I can't do that all day. Okay? So I have to be able to look at this and say, yeah, so I can't get in here, I can't get in here. All right. So if I do the risk-to-reward assessment, I say, okay, the only way I can do this is if I get in here at the worst. Okay, that's the last place that I can get in for me. All right, that's, the, that's it. I'd prefer to get in here. And a lot of times, as you guys notice today, it's not when you see a responsive pattern, most of the time you're in the trade before anything ever rotates. Your fills will usually be here. Okay? You'll usually be in the bottom three ticks. But what I'm telling myself is that I can't. I can't get into this unless, it, unless that's where my fill is. Okay? To me, that's the only thing that's worth it. Can I get filled there? I don't know. What if I don't get filled? Do I chase it? Do I say, it doesn't matter. This is going to be a great trade. I just got to get in. How many of you have done that? All of us, I would imagine. I've done it. Yeah. 
And, and that's the point, is that the better my entry, the lower the stop, the bigger the risk to reward, the more potential for the trade, all of it, right? So I have to look at it that way. Now, listen, guys, there's going to be times where you're going to see beautiful textbook patterns. And this will be a huge period, and you'll see nothing in it, just nothing but light trade all the way down. And you'll say, pooh. I don't have anything, a point in front of me that's going to be difficult, right? So if it comes down and my entry's here to limit long and I don't get filled because only 25 contracts trade and it upticks a little bit and comes back down, can I get into it then? Sure. Can I chase myself into it? Go up the next tick? Yeah, if the risk to reward is fine. If my initial target's up here, yes. I can afford a little bit bigger stop, you know, all that stuff. These are the decisions I have to make. Can I chase it? Do I, do I, is there absolutely no way? In this instance, there is absolutely no way. This is very tight. Okay, very tight here. Now, we're looking at an example where it's basically balanced on the top and on the bottom, right? 3,000 contracts at the price levels above, 3,000 below. Okay, but there's going to be times where, you know, you're going to see the, um, you're going to see a substantial amount of trade that came in, and it's going to be very close to where you are. And you're going to go, well, sure looks like a good responsive buying pattern, but I can't do it. I just can't justify it. Okay, and the trade will take off, and it'll be fantastic, and you won't be in it. Did you make a good choice or a bad choice? Yeah. Does it really matter that you missed a trade? Wouldn't you be better off being a professional about it and saying, I at least know what my limitations are? Sorry that I missed the trade, but come on. I'm not going to risk stuff like that. Because if you get lucky, you'll stop paying attention to this stuff. If you get lucky, you'll go, ah, I'm just going to do it. And believe me, it won't work. You'll never be able to replicate your successes if you don't have a fixed methodology for doing this. And this is the process, guys. This is what we do. Okay? We have to, to do this. We have to get ready. And then once the trade comes together and we're in it and we get executed, forget about everything else. Proactively manage. Be a participant in your trade. Do not be passive and sit back and cross your fingers. and Oh, my gosh, is it going to work? Forget that. You cannot do it. Okay? And as this develops, look what happens here. Is this any surprise? Is this any surprise to anybody here at all that the buyers would start buying up here and then hit a brick wall? After everything that we've just been through, is it a surprise? Is anybody having a moment here where they say, oh my gosh, this is starting to kind of make sense? Yeah, I mean, does it make sense why, oh my gosh, now I understand why it's so damn hard for my trade to take off? How about we do another moment, okay? How about this? How many of you guys have been traders that use indicators? And the basis of almost any ind indicator is that when the market reverses and starts moving the other direction, where does it usually give you a signal? Maybe two points off, off of something? If the market's moving down and then the market starts moving up, where do you get your buy signal? Here? Do you ever get yeah. do you ever get your buy signals here with indicators? Okay, imagine we've got that beautiful moving average and the moving average comes down and then it moves up. Yeah, well, okay. And how many times do you get that, that signal and it says, go long, go long, and you get into the trade and then the market just stops and you think, well, God, just rocket it up off the bottom here. Why did it stop right here? Anybody having that aha moment? You know? Yeah. I mean, seriously, guys. This is, this is the stuff that you're up against. 
and that nobody nobody wants to get their hands around. But you know, to me, if I don't see any of that, those sellers initiating before, and I see that they're a few points off, let's say that they're three points away from where I'm looking to get long, do I? Yes, I'm in that trade. That's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for this stuff where the market churns and churns and churns and churns and back and forth, and all I see is trade everywhere. Okay, That may be what we're given the last three days. That doesn't mean that you have to take it. Why? Because now you understand what risk to reward is. You know how hard it's going to be. You know what it's going to be like to get through there. Everybody's looked at this for three days. How long do you think it sat here? Was this one minute where we printed... 25,000 contracts? Heck no. No way. This took forever, I'm sure. It sat here and sat here and sat here and churned. But guess what? It turned into a good trade. Why? The buyers initiated enough trade to get us through there. Okay, so let me ask you something. Where is my advantage as a trader? Is my advantage here to get in after the lag and I see that it's reversed and, uh, oh, wow, you know, I'm going to get in when everything else triggers and try and push the market up? Or, or is my advantage to recognize this early and say, you know what, it's going to trade to here. How about I get long? as early as I can and capitalize on that. Set myself up so that if I take a few few ticks out of the market and take some profit here when everybody else is just thinking about getting long, then all I have to do is wait around and find out whether or not I'm right. Okay? Now, could it have turned around and gone back against me? Yeah. But if I was smart enough to capitalize on this and take a little bit out of it, where I already established a target, then all I have to do is use some sort of break-even stop or get out at entry or whatever. You know, I'd rather be a little bit right than all the way wrong. And it is, Jim. It's a lot easier to manage a trade when you're in it and you're profitable. You can manage from here. You're terrified from here. Right? What have we got? Okay. Let's assume for the purposes of discussion that we see this come together and it's got maybe a 1,300 commitment of trader here. We're going to have a stop somewhere up here, right? We know that the only real trade that's taken place here is here. And we would assume that if the buyers got back in control of that, that this thing's probably gone, right? So we, we need to have a stop somewhere above where the high volume is, and maybe we just make it right above the high. Okay? So we know where the stop is. What about a target? Based on the information at hand, do we have any kind of a target? Anybody see anything that ought to be difficult? I don't. Looks like smooth sailing to me. Okay. So let's just say that we've got a target down here to be determined. Entry. Do we feel confident that we could enter this trade? Sure. Based on the risk to reward... Yeah, if I can get a, a short into this here, yeah. Now let's think about a situation like this, okay? If, if, if I'm not unable to actually enter this trade within the transaction of this au auction, in other words, uh, we're looking at obviously something that's already happened. So this would be the uh, open, the high, and the close, right? 
So we're, we're looking at this after the fact. But let's assume for the purposes of discussion that this transpires while we're paying attention to it and we see the commitment of traders and all of that good stuff and we are able to get a fill short here, maybe, well, probably not here, but, but here before it closes. Okay, most of the responsive patterns, that's what you're going to get. Okay, most of them you're going to be filled within the bulk of the trade because that's the way we've designed it is for you to be able to recognize this before it happens okay? while it's in the process instead of after the fact. All right? However, if we're out here and we see this happen and we see the market rotate, it's, mo it's moved up and it rotates down and we open up a new period here, I want you to think about where you would be willing to get into a trade. Now we've established that our, our upside is, is basically endless and our, and our drawdown is, is, is fairly fixed. Okay. Where, sh where should I be thinking about being willing to get into this trade? And Mike's put up this level and I like that. Okay. And Johnny's put up the blue line and I want to discuss this with you. Okay. I want to discuss this with you. If I put a limit order here to go short, what has to happen in order for me to get filled with a limit sell order at price? Yeah. I mean, in simple terms, one tick, but you got it. Buyer's got to lift to the ask, right? Right. So that means that essentially we've got to have the ask price return back here. Okay? So if we start trading back up on the top of this, am I going to still be really excited about this trade? Yeah, Lev's got a good point, then maybe I don't want it, right? Okay? Maybe, maybe I don't want it. And would it be a better fill? Heck yeah. If the trade works out and I go limit short here, this would be a better fill than here or here or anything else. But I'm going to tell you, if this trade works out, very rarely is it going to trade back up above where this trade is without then even expanding further. Yeah. And it's not, hey, and I am a fan of getting the best fill that you can. Most money in trading is made, is made tick by tick. People who get in and out of the market with market orders, in my opinion, are fools. Okay? You're giving away 25 bucks every time you do that. But, that being said, this is going to be a hard fill if it's already past tense. If it's in the creation of this, this will be a hard fill because it will have to tick back through there. And if it does, then you're kind of sitting there going, e, do I want this? So most of the time in a situation like this, I would tell you after the fact in the next period that you should be targeting here with a limit order in front of the high volume. And in a case like this, we established that we have basically no buyers that have come in to hold this up, would it be unreasonable for me to chase into this a little bit? Let's say that I have to go here to get filled. One, two, three, four, five tick stop versus whatever profit target I can come up with more than a few points away. I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay? What do we got? Responsive buying. All right? Doesn't look like we've got anything in our way with sellers coming into this, does it? We're looking to get into this long as low as we can, as close to the high volume as we can. Upside potential is only going to be determined by what other targets we can come up with. Stop in this case is probably only going to be three or four ticks. 
Now again, we're, we're working with limited information here, so bear with me. I know that you're saying, well, what about something else or you know, whatever questions going through your mind there. Just a limited amount of information that we have. But based on what we have, we're saying that these sellers are going to get trapped up here. Okay? They're going to have to come out. So if we see the price then start working back below where the bulk of selling took place, I don't want to be in this. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, so whether that's a, a stop one tick below or two ticks below, whatever you're comfortable with, okay, this has to work for you. What have we got? Correct. Sellers initiate trade. Sellers break the market down. They find a level of temporary support and initiate enough trade to continue the market lower. The key factor here is we want to make sure that as the buyers start lifting this up that they're not coming in with full force, right? We don't want to see multiple thousands of contracts stack up here, right? What happened on the way down here? Sellers. Buyer gives up, right? Would you say that once we got past this point, the seller was able to break it down fairly easily? And then here we really see a lack of trade? Yeah. Nine times out of ten, this is going to come right off of the bottom, right back up to where this very, very light volume is, and we're going to see this from here. Where would we put a stop, and where would our target be? We're making an assumption about this and classifying it from the standpoint that the seller has engaged the market. Right? So if these sellers are going to protect their positions, then I need to stop somewhere right beyond them, right? Because if they start flipping, this thing's gone. Right? So I'm going to target a stop somewhere up here. And guys, we looked at a lot of, of, of uh, uh, examples yesterday where it went one or two ticks beyond the, the high volume, right? So I don't want you too focused on blue lines. I want you thinking about what took place here. This is where the bulk of trade is, okay? We shouldn't see it trade back through this. We should be looking for an entry where the buyer gave up with a stop here. This is maybe going to be a risk of five ticks at the most. What's my target? The only information we have here, very good, Mike, is that the buying stopped here. I mean, the selling stopped here. Right? That's the only information that we have in this picture. So we may have a target down at, at like Bob's target, zero. Okay? We may have a target at the bottom of the world. But what I need to be aware of are two things. Okay? The first is that for whatever reason, the selling stopped here. And actually it really didn't. You can see that there was trade. I'm sorry, trade at the ask. Okay? But for whatever reason, the selling stopped here and the buyer came in and started lifting it back up. Is there any reason why we couldn't see the same thing happen again? No. We see double bottoms all the time. Okay. The other piece of information, who's upside down? Remember, when the sellers broke this down, we had buyers trying to respond and bring the market back up. Right? In this case, they're probably mostly out of this okay, because we've got a pretty good spread here. But for me, whenever I'm looking at something like this, and 
I am always going to be looking at this in the, in the standpoint that if all we do is run the stops on these guys and bring it back up, I need, I need to be aware of what happens when we get back to the bottom of this, right? Now, the other piece of information is that sellers initiating trade or buyers initiating trade represent what? Breakdown, breakout. These are not trades to use a one-point target on. This means that somebody's in control and they're going to drive the market probably to your bigger targets. So I'm always so discouraged to see people go through the, pro the process of risking everything to take one point. Oh, really? I mean, ow. This is, these are moves. These are powerful moves, right? Not every one of them is going to produce 10 points or 7 points or whatever. But if we have an expectation that the market's going to move, this is what it does. This is how it moves. This is it. Okay? So take some profit and get yourself set up for break even. But pay attention to what happens down here. Because unless you get a responsive buying pattern down here, hold on to it. It's probably going to move, right? It's probably going to move. Um, knowing me, Lev, I'm going to take my first profit somewhere up here just to make sure that I get free trade. I usually take profit at three to four ticks. And then what I do is use a three to four tick stop so that it equals nothing if I if I lose. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But there are times where, like yesterday, I got upside down quickly. My objective was to find a good breakout trade and just take plus two as my target or something in that, in that realm, right? Because this is not the kind of way to work myself out of a hole. So if, I, if I'm able to see a target and, I've, and I you know, have a good setup on the trade and everything, yeah. I'll, I'll certainly take things bigger. But for the most part, look, uh, at any point when you guys are trading with me and you feel like I'm strung out, you know, or I've just stressed myself out about something, I'll be surprised. Because that's not how I trade. And you'll get the sense of that. I'm, you know, it's just not anything to get blood pressure worked up over. You know, if you have a methodology and you, you're functional at it and you're consistent, trading does not become a heart attack scenario. And there are a lot of people that just can't get over that. But for me, it's not. And the reason is, is because I approach it as the lowest possible risk that I can get myself into. I'm a conservative trader. I don't get myself in a jam very often. Every now and then I'll make some dumb decisions. But in the long run, that ain't, that's not who I am. Okay? And I try and project that onto you as well. Yeah, and I don't run the, uh, I don't roll up my sleeves and run the booyah. Um, no, but I mean, we, we celebrate here and we talk about things when, when things go wrong. Don't get me wrong. It's just that uh, I am not going to get stressed out about things and because it, it'll wreck you as a trader. It'll wreck you. So I would rather approach the market very conservatively. It probably is what provides me with the longevity that I've had as a trader. I know people that end up divorced and, yeah, I mean, you know, there's just no reason to put yourself through that. And certainly not for 50 bucks at a time. You want to go through all that, start, you know, start trading 100 or 200 contracts. Okay, buyers initiate trade. We see the buyer come in. We know that they had a little difficulty getting through here, but we see that they were able to initiate enough trade. So what I'm interested in is what happened when the seller came back down. Okay, no, ma no massive trade here, right? I don't see some huge influx of trade. Okay. I know where the buyer came in. What about where the seller gave up? Right about here, right? Buyer came in all through here, I can probably use a stop 
right about there, maybe a little bit lower. If I wanted to be really safe, I'd target some of this stuff here. Right, just get on the other side of all of that. All right, so uh, target, obviously the, the top here, I need to be focused on whether or not we can actually break out back through this. A couple of things that look good to me here. Notice how we have trade on both sides. Who was it that I gave a lesson to pre-market yesterday about the zero? See down here? Right. Okay. The indication when we have trade at the bid, at the high, is that even though there was no volume printed at the next level, the buyers were able to push the ask price up. That's the only way that this is the bid price. Okay. So in order to have trade at the bid, the ask actually had to lift one more level, even though we didn't print any volume there tells me that the buyers did not give up, right? They were trading through the market depth. They didn't have any problem pushing it up. So that's good, you know? To me, this means, yeah, look for a target up here, but it's going higher. Okay, so I'm looking for an entry as this pulls back somewhere around here where the seller gave up. This is probably my entry. I established a stop down here I've got a tentative target at the high. I can take this trade with a larger expectation, right? Anybody argue with that? Okay. Responsive buyer comes in, we see the seller trapped. Right? Our objective is to get long within this somewhere. If we weren't able to do that, we would probably be targeting a long somewhere right here because we've got nothing up here. No target here. This is one we could chase into, right? If we didn't get the fill, maybe we could try and get filled here. I would venture to say I would not have gotten filled on this trade unless I got filled in the in the period. I know me, I know how I trade. I would have put a limit order right here, and I might have moved it up to here when it didn't rotate back to it, but I probably never would have gotten filled. I just know how I am. I'm being honest. But you can see it. You can see that your target shouldn't have been an issue, your stop shouldn't have been an issue, and you should have been able to enter the trade somewhere right here. Okay. Well, then we see the confirmation of that trade, right, because we see the buyers then initiate trade. If I'm, if I'm long and I actually got into that, hallelujah. That's exactly what I want to see. I'm going to hold this sucker. No idea, Brad. Responsive trades, almost almost 100% of them I'm filled in the period. Okay, Almost 100% on responsive trades. On initiating trades, I would say high 90% comes from the second uh, period. I very rarely ever get into a breakout or breakdown within the current period, and I almost always get into a reversal within the current period. The reason is is because it's, this is the only way I can really limit my risk is to get filled here. Right? And if you get filled in a response in a initiating trade period, you're usually at very high risk. If you went long here, not much room to move, right? Always. Okay, so we see here kind of some interesting trade, right? We know this is responsive selling. If we recognize it while it's coming together, we're going to have a stop somewhere on the other side of this. What's going on, though, in this? Right? 
this is this is the last place where we saw any sort of real trade take place on both sides. This entire period is filled with volume, right? So if I'm looking to trade this, unless I'm filled up at the top, this is going to be pretty lousy, right? This is probably not the, the most ideal scenario and certainly not for one after the fact, right? If I had to wait and get short here, Brad, I'll address your question in a second, okay? If I had to wait and get filled here, this would be very difficult, right? And what do we see? We see that it was very difficult, don't we? Okay? So just because everything comes together and we see the, the, the pattern and everything, we can't always justify this. And in this case, I probably couldn't. I would venture to say this is not a trade I'd be willing to take. It's not that it's something overwhelming, but I mean, this is just a lot of volume all in one place. And I like to see those empty pockets where I know I'm going to have a good solid run and not much trouble. Oh, I'm sorry, Brad. I read that wrong. I, I just glanced down at it. I thought you said it makes no sense, but obviously we're on the same page. Sorry. Okay, this is a pattern that I asked you to star yesterday. This is about as good as it gets, guys. This is probably my favorite thing to trade. We have the sellers initiating trade. They drive the market down to a level and break it down, okay? They break it down. Well, this is a pretty good spread here. This isn't just coming back, you know, seven ticks. There's a lot of trade in between here and there. And I need to establish whether or not it's really realistic that we're going to come all the way back up here. And the reason, the, I'm sorry, not the reason, the way that I'm going to do that is by trying to identify what took place in the trade afterwards. Okay. So obviously the sellers were breaking down the market here, working it very hard. And then we see that it gets fairly light again, right? What's the other characteristic that we see? We see the buyer getting up here, right? We can see the seller where he had trouble and where he finally got through and how it kind of the, the volume lightened up to something that's probably more reasonable, like 1,500 contracts. And we see that the buyer was really not a participant, right? And then the seller started working it again on the lows. Buyer rotated this back up, and we see some decent trade here, right? When we've got this kind of a spread, what you're really looking for is to find a responsive selling pattern. Okay. I'm going to target a, a short up here, and I'm going to be looking to short into this probably right where the heavy volume drops off. And I'm going to be looking for a short here, and my stop is going to be up above where the sellers broke it down, so I've got a stop up here. I can see where the bulk of trade is. There's no reason for me to carry it any further than that. All right. Let's clean this up. Stop here. What about a target? Well, I can see trade coming in here, target. Where do I need to get filled? One, two, three, this would be four ticks off to make one, two, three, four, maybe five. All right. I really need to get filled somewhere around here. So I go in with a limit order. And then I see the market start to come up. And I get filled. And I see all this taking place. And I say, ha, 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 ha. Uh, excellent. Excellent. I have a responsive selling pattern. This is telling me to sell. This is telling me to sell. This is going to be great. When you see these two patterns in a row, take the trade. Even if you don't get filled here, even if you don't get filled here, I want you focused on how would I trade this by itself, right? 
I've got to find a target, a stop, and everything else. Well, my stop is going to be relative to this volume, but more importantly, I know where it needs to be, so maybe my stop's going to be here. Best entry I'm going to find probably here. Target here. Hopefully this is still better than one to one. These are fantastic trades. Sellers initiate trade. We see the light volume through the through the low, we know that we should be targeting an entry somewhere around where the sellers broke this down. Okay? We have to come up with a stop. If I'm looking at what's taking place here, you know, th this is it. Otherwise, I've got to start carrying myself all the way back up here. Right? So yeah, my stop is probably right above this. I doubt it's even any further than that. And all I'm looking for is for this to lift and find an entry somewhere up in this. So in this case, maybe I've got something like a two or three tick stop. And I'm just judging the entry on what my stop is. Get a, get a couple of ticks away from where, I, where I'm looking for a stop. Why would this be responsive buying? One, two, three, four, five levels the seller breaks the, the market down beyond the high volume, pulls back, seller breaks the market down, and here you might make an argument for that. So, assuming that we're able to get into this short, look what happens. This is the only place where there was even remotely some trade, and look what it was against. This didn't even stop here. This just drove. Okay. All right, so buyers engage the market. Um, this would be probably the only spot that we would even consider being an issue because there was no seller here. So if my stop's up above and I can establish a target here, pretty much need to be filled right up at the top of this thing. Okay? And you need to anyways because if you start getting filled five ticks off the, off the high, then you're looking at at least a six tick stop. I want you using small stops, right? I don't want you getting into to anything more than that. And so maybe we can get filled if it happens in within this. But otherwise, you know, we basically have to get filled short one tick in front of this or this isn't going to pay off. And I don't even know that I'd consider this a huge issue for the target, but that's the first thing that I see. And when we traded down, that's the only place that we ran into a little bit of effort where the buyer was trying to buy back up, but it really doesn't correlate in volume, right? Instead, they just break it down, pull it back up, and break it down again. Right? But I can justify taking this trade because I can find out where I need to stop. More or less, the, the only place that's going to be a little bit difficult for me is where there was a lack of sellers here and a little bit of buying. couple of responsive buying patterns here. Stop down below. I don't have anything to worry about as a target, do I? Looking to get long somewhere right in front of the high volume. Next period comes down. Sellers try and drive it down a little bit further, but end up with the buyers lifting it back up. And then we have buyers initiating trade. Eric, you've got a question on the other slide? we got to pick up the pace a little bit, guys.
I'm going to move on. You can send me a... So the center bar wick, why you don't use trailing stops. I don't use trailing stops because they don't make any sense to me. There's nothing logical about a trailing stop. If you know how to read what's going on in the market, you, you make those decisions. You don't use something that's numerically based. Right? If I tell you I know where my target and where my stop should be, why shouldn't I know where to move my stop? Eric, let's say that you get long after this buyers, these buyers initiate trade. Let's say that you get long here. Okay? You'd have a stop down below where the buyers initiated trade, right? Well, if then we see a responsive buying pattern followed by buyers initiating trade, and we're up here, and you're long from down here, where would you move your stop? Would that make sense to you? This is where the buyers initiated trade. Why am I going to have a stop all the way down here? This is the point that should be hard for them to get through, right? But if I use a one-point tra trailing stop, my stop's going to be what, here? I mean, I want to give my, my trades room to run, right? So I use the exact same premise of locating my stop. Every time I see new trade initiated, I determine whether or not it's substantial enough for me to move a stop and, and use that as a back brace. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any reason to, to move it up incrementally two points because the market rotates and moves back and forth more than that. <coughs> Okay, here we've got an interesting situation, and I want to go through this one. We see a responsive buying pattern down here, but what, what else is significant about this, guys? If we had to come up with a target and a stop, we could say we come up with a stop down here, but what about a target? I mean, look at all the trade that took place here. be pretty difficult to trade through here, right? So if I come up with something and say it's going to be difficult to trade through here, and if I don't get filled down here, and I wait for this to rotate, uh, I don't know, right? I don't know that I'm going to be able to take a trade here, just based on what I'm seeing. Yeah, very good. So what happens on the next period? We see the buyers initiate trade through that. That negates anything that took place here. There's nothing else here that I have to worry about. This looks like a whole better deal if I can, okay, well, they told me to go long here, but I just couldn't do it. But now this is saying there's a long opportunity. Okay? And buyers initiate trade, and we see light trade coming back. And where did the seller give up? Here. Where am I looking to get long? Here. What happens after that? Right? All because I established early on that the only place that I was going to have trouble was here. And that was taken out. I don't have to worry about anything above that. Not with the information that I've got here. And this told me to go long. And this told me to go long. And dang it, I can do it if I get through this, but I can't do it until I get on the other side of that. So we follow multiple patterns and we look at things one after the other and say, is this confirming that? I couldn't do it then, but I can do it now, right? All right, you'll have plenty of time to go back through that and I'm happy to work through scenarios with you when we're trading live, okay? Obviously, that's what I want to do. I want you to see these things. I want you to ask questions. I want you to engage the process. It's going to take work, guys. And I know you're all sitting here going, yeah, well, this is all static. And I can look, 
Most of the time, the market doesn't move that fast, even when it's moving fast. You look at order flow for a month, and you're going to go, I got this. All right? You are. It just doesn't take very long to train your eyes to do it. But you've got to have that process in mind. You've got to say, look, before I risk anything, I need to know this stuff. And maybe the first time you do it, you're not going to be quick enough, and you might miss a trade. And the second time, you might fumble it a little. But believe me, as they're developing and you see the pattern and you see it all come together, it's not very hard to go, okay, is this far enough away? And I don't need to pull out a calculator and write this down and say, uh, it's going to be six ticks down and four ticks up. You're going to be able to make those decisions on the fly. You are, because the information's right in front of you and you're going to get trained to do it. Okay? But every trade has to have that process or else you are not doing your job. And if you're not doing your job, do you expect to be paid? I mean, unless you're on welfare. No, you don't, right? You shouldn't have an expectation of success if you're not willing to do the work. Unfortunately, we create an environment where people think that that's right, but I don't. Okay? All right, let's talk about what a reversal really is, okay? This is going to tie into algorithms and understanding a lot. You've had two days of order flow, two and a half days of order flow, and it's time that we really break down the nuts and bolts of what takes place when direction changes in the market. Right? Obviously, if the market is moving down, the only way that we're going to stop the market from moving down and reverse is a combination of a few things. Right? So those of you that are mathematically inclined might really enjoy this. Right. <clears throat> if we have an increase in the volume take place, it's going to correlate with an increase in demand. Right. That means that the market depth that used to be 1,000 is now much higher than that. And every time that the sellers sell into it, somebody reloads it. Okay? So the first piece of the puzzle to go from a move down to a move up is that the sellers that are selling in and that have had such great success trading through the market depth <clears throat> now find themselves unable to do so. Right? It's much harder. That's what we saw on all of those slides where we saw a responsive buying pattern. It's that very light volume on the way down, cutting through the market depth, and then suddenly... Well, how in the world did we trade 6,000 contracts there? We were only trading 1,500 above. More, more, and more demand, right? That's only going to get us so far. Okay? If the demand increases, that doesn't mean that the, that the supply coming into it can't increase as well. So we need to see that the market sellers have given up. Right? At least temporarily, and it may just be for a flash of a moment. But if we see that the market seller is having no trouble driving the market lower, we ought to continue to see it move level by level down through the market depth. But when we see a little zero show up at the ask on the low, that means that the sellers have been unable to push the bid price one price lower. Right? They haven't traded through all of the market depth. If there are 2,000 contracts there and they've only print 300, that means that there's 1,700 left in a static sense. Okay? They were unable to drive the market any lower. Therefore, there's no way that the ask price shifted down to have volume print there. So when we see probes and rotations on our chart, that's what we look for. We see a zero. We know that at least for the moment, the market sellers have terminated. They have not been able to sell through the market depth. That, again, is only going to stop the market. What we're looking for is a reversal. So what, obviously what must take place is if we've had this increase in demand and a decrease in supply, then we have to have an increase in market buyers now initiating new trade. Right? We have to have them conceding to the higher price. We have to have them running the market. And when we get those three things, it says airspeed here, but read that as commitment of traders. 
Okay? When we have these three things, an increase in the volume, what, is that, what does that mean to you guys? Increase in the volume means that the high volume level has shifted to the low. Would that make sense? Agree or disagree? Okay. High volume shifts to the low. That's telling us right there that the increased volume indicates that there is more demand in the market than we were expecting. The zero at the ask indicates that the market sellers have terminated their, their selling, at least for the moment. The commitment of traders now seeing positive net contracts come in, meaning that they are, initiate, that they are traded at the ask and that they're outweighing those traded at the bid would indicate market buyers are now coming in to the market, initiating trade. Those three things are what reverses the market. Okay. If we only have two of them, for example, the sellers halted by increased volume or the high volume moving to the low, and we maybe see the sellers run out of gas, but we don't see that commitment of traders come in, then a lot of times what we're about to do is start consolidating. Okay? In other words, the market's been moving down, it has stopped, but it's not going to reverse. Okay? So we're looking for these three things to come together. Now obviously it's going to do that all day long. Every time we have a probe down, eventually there's going to be uh, some termination of the sellers and some buyers will come in. So we have to correlate this to, th to, to areas where we would expect there to be a significant influx of, of buyers. Right? So tomorrow we're going to be talking about chart structure and how important that is. But these three things indicate the potential for a reversal to take place. Just as when the market is moving up, we would expect that buyers would only be halted by an increase in volume. We would have to see an increase in the supply. And if those buyers terminate their buying, meaning that they're unable to push the ask to the next level, then we would see a zero at the bid at that price. The only thing we will need at that point is the sellers to then come in and start initiating trade or hitting the bid. And so if we see that heavy negative commitment of traders, there's an indication that we might be in the midst of a reversal. Now what all that means to us is that we can put that into the software, right? We can start coming up with different algorithms for how to read that information. And so for those of you that have opted for the algorithmic support and resistance piece of the software, very often what you'll see are gray bars forming and then red or green start to come out of that. And what it's telling you is that the conditions are beginning to form. When we see the market probe, excuse me, when we see the market probe up and we see the high volume shift up to the top and we see all these things come together and then suddenly there's a gray bar there like where the, the 4275 is on this and it says 240. What it's telling you is pay attention. Pay attention. The conditions for a reversal are building right now. Okay? It's not saying execute a trade. It's saying get ready, alert, pay attention. These are the things that we look for. Okay, so stage one, you'll see a gray formation come onto your chart. And as those conditions are met, and there's more evidence of that actually taking place, it will change to either red for a sell or green for a buy. Okay? So what we're looking at in terms of the algorithm coming together is in the first stage seeing the market buyer meet the increased limit supply and terminate, meaning that 240 is trade at the ask and there is no trade at the bid. When we start to see the commitment of traders matching, we'll see that shift in control. And essentially what it's producing for us is an on the spot, in the midst of it, development of resistance. Okay. We don't see a whole lot of signals anymore. Right, right now the, the market is, is churning and we're seeing huge numbers of volume. Okay. But when this happens, pay attention to it. 
You know, pay attention, look at it and say, is this, am I looking to short here? Because if I am, this thing is telling me you can get in at the top tick. If I'm looking for a short and I see this come together right next to the levels that I'm interested in, yeah, I'm in. You know, I took one yesterday. It ended up not panning out, but it came together beautifully right where I wanted to short. I'm not going to argue with that. The conditions are just primed for it. Obviously, the opposite would be when, a, when the market sellers meet increased limit demand and the sellers terminate. In this case, all of the trade would be at the ask. I'm sorry, at the bid. So 130 at the bid, zero at the ask. And when that condition is met by the commitment of traders, it'll shift to green. So at gray, you're not going, I have to buy it, I have to buy it, I have to buy it. Now I'm going to warn you that this is not red light, green light trading. Okay? A lot of people will sit in, they'll sit through class for five days and they'll do a little bit of homework and everything else and then as soon as in the middle of the next day there is a signal somewhere on the chart, they freak out. Is that short? Is that short? Are we shorting? Are we short, 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 short? Come on. You know, you can't approach trading that way. Understand what it means, okay? And if you paid attention to the last two slides, you should, or three slides, you should understand what it means, that the conditions are just right for a reversal. Okay? We have to correlate that with something, though. You know? Is that the, the levels that we were discussing at the, at the open? Is this the current high, uh, you know, of the day? Is this, do we, we just traded back across a range? Are we in the middle of an area where we're not looking for a trade anyways? Because I wouldn't be trading off responsive buying, so why am I suddenly enamored with it because there's a green light on it? And don't confuse this for automated trading. Don't confuse it for not having to do the work. That's not what it's for. Right? It's to tell you when there's prime opportunity. Prime opportunity. Pay attention. Is this something that you're looking at? Is it? Okay, great. Take the trade. Now, with this, I'll, I'll have to teach you at another time, Johnny. We've, we've been through it a bunch this week, so I can't do it again right now. We're way behind. Now, with this, obviously, we will be doing, uh, we have the ability to put in orders into the market in a way that no other trading platform does. Okay? This was the very first thing that I developed when I started with this software. Because to me, 90% of what I was doing was trading against the, the momentum of the market. And I am really good at coming up with targets to do that. But I'm not perfect. And it's really difficult for those of you that have ever done it. Put on a limit order when the market's just moving straight up. And you put on a limit order to sell. And then it just bla blazes right through you. Oh. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it'll wound you. Okay? So what we came up with was a concept whereby we could say, look, on our chart, if, if I recognize that 650 is something that I'm looking to short at, then why don't I have the ability to put in a conditional order where if it drives right through there and we don't get any sort of pattern in the order flow, then it's just going to sail on and not send a trade. But what if... If I select that area and then the market trades right up there and we get this very, very early signal of a reversal, then I'd be willing to put on a trade. Right? So instead of having to worry about, is it near the high volume? Can I get filled here? Can I do this? Can I do that? That's when I want to send a trade. Only if, only if I get everything to, to come together where I'm looking. So obviously this takes some some. Uh, you know, there's a little bit more to the puzzle here. How do I come up with a number like 650? Well, I have to learn how to read how to read chart structure. I have to come up with ways for valuing the market. So if I can't do that to start with, it's probably not going to do me a whole lot of good. But hopefully after tomorrow, most of you will know the at least the foundations for how to do that. So when I start the day out and I tell you, here's what I'm looking at today, and I give you a bunch of numbers... What I'm doing is going to my Trader Assist interface, setting up my account, going to my chart, and I'm 
selecting these price levels. That way if we trade up to them and we get everything just right, it's going to send a trade for me. And if it blazes through it, I don't have to worry about it. So you've got the opportunity to do a lot of very, very low risk trading here. Okay? Now the way that we do this, because I, you know, I, I think I'm pretty good at it, but I don't think I'm the, the you know, God's gift to finding uh, uh, you know, highs and lows, is that you know, I can identify something like um, a, a range. Okay, if I tell you I'm looking for a 14-point range and then I look at that and it matches with some previous highs or something, that may be a number like 650. Okay? But I'm not so silly that I think I'm always going to know exactly what the is and that's where it's going to come in. So instead what we do is we have the ability for you to isolate a range. Okay? <laughs> oh, is it? I don't even have a chart up, guys. 35.50, huh? Interesting. Um, so what I can do is I can establish a range by telling it I want to look at 650 as a potential. Okay. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, all right, well, what if it's one tick off of that, meaning plus a tick and minus a tick? Okay, well, I want to look for everything within that three tick range or five tick range or seven tick range. Okay? And within your... Trader Assist interface, you've got the ability to do that. You can tell it whether you want to send limit orders or market orders. And if you want to send limit orders, how far off the signal? Uh, you can tell it an awful lot. Right? It's the same interface that runs your trade tracker, which we'll go through in just a minute. So it's a, it's a very unique way of looking at things if you're, if you're skilled at valuing the market, which I all hope that you will be, okay? You have to learn how to value the market or none of this is going to do you any good. Okay? But it's obviously not something that you just magically learn how to do that overnight. But we can teach you. Okay? We can show you what we do. And there's a reason that we came up with these, these numbers this morning. And I'm really glad to see 3550 happens to be it. But, you know, all the same, I was still expecting a much bigger range than we're trading. So the idea is that when this comes together and we see a pattern form there, if I've got that, those levels isolated, in this case like a three tick range, it's going to go ahead and send the trade for me. Oops. And I don't have to worry about uh, where's my trade placement and did I miss the signal and blah, 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 blah. Okay? It's just designed to do it. Now this does require NinjaTrader. I haven't written it to any other interface. Uh, I would not suggest going out and changing your life to use NinjaTrader just because you've seen this feature, okay? Just, just because it's something that's neat and everything else, I don't recommend go out and get NinjaTrader and change everything. You're here in boot camp. Let's start by getting you a, as a functional, consistent trader, okay? I want you to be consistent. I want you to make money every day. I want you to be confident in what you're doing. I want you to comprehend all of the concepts that we're going through. And at that point, if you feel like you would have an added benefit by these things, then by all means do it. You know? And if you're already a NinjaTrader user, you might skip the process of using conditional orders right now and just be very happy that you have trade tracking because to me there's not anything more powerful than that. I'd never take a trade without it again ever. And that's my feeling on it. Speaking of trade tracking, it's a, there, it's a unique feature here. It's something that I came up with. It's not offered anywhere else. Um, this is a way that we track the, you know, the net difference between buyers and sellers, but not from some arbitrary point on a chart. It's from your execution. So again, this is, this is written to the NinjaTrader interface. So it's not available for anything else. I apologize for that. For a while there, I got into the mode where I was going to write it for a whole bunch of different platforms, but guess what? I can't stand the support. It just makes me crazy. I mean, it's like this thing with Windows 7. Ah, oh, I mean, I just got through dealing with Windows Vista, and now I, I, I load the software on two people's computers that have Windows 7, and the display is just ridiculous. You know, what in the world? How is that even possible? You know, but sure enough, it's an issue. 
and we'll have to get over it. So the last thing I'm going to do is write this for 15 different platforms. But if anybody is dead set on trading with uh, TradeStation or something else and you've got four or $5,000 in your pocket, I'm more than happy to have the, the programmer do it for you. Um, the net control of contracts, meaning from the minute we execute, this is the commitment of traders. This is the buyers versus the sellers. So this is to me. This is my contract. So if I get into a trade and you get into a trade 30 seconds later, our, our control number is not going to be the same. Okay? It's not going to be the same. You're, you're interested in your trade. I'm interested in my trade. And they shouldn't be that different, but obviously at the end of the day, what I'm interested in is following my position. I'm taking ownership of my position. You know, I'd love to say I, I'm, I'm going to follow all of y'all's trades. I hope you're profitable, but at the end of the day, the way that I make money is trading, not selling software. So that's what I, that's what I want to know is where am I in the flow of orders? Okay. The second field is going to tell you the percentage of your volume gain that you're retaining. Okay. So let's assume for a moment that you go long and 2,000 sellers come in and then 5,000 buyers come in. Okay. You will have a net gain of 3,000 contracts positive in your long, right? That would be the highest gain that we've seen. So the, the percentage would probably say 100%. But if a 1,000 contracts came in short after that, the percent would drop to 66%, meaning your gain in volume has dropped by a third. Okay? For the most part, you're not really going to be concerned with this until you're in a working trade. And what I mean by a working trade is something where you've already seen the initial push. Okay? You've already gotten a couple of points into, you know, to your first target. You have a working trade. And what I'm concerned with is having a trade that comes on very strong and then getting all of the volume beaten back. And I'm going to tell you right now, volume leads price all the time. So if I watch the trade tracker and I see that the sellers are coming in very strong, price I may still be very profitable. And I may still be two points in the profit. But a, a few minutes later, it may be right back at my entry. Okay? Because all of that weight is starting to come into the market and the control is shifting. So I want to pay attention to this when I'm in a working trade and I want to be focused on not giving up too much of my gain. And this takes practice, guys. It's not something that there's some textbook that I can give you and tell you 50% exit your trade. Okay. Now, in terms of the scale, the way that it's built is to show you buyer and seller control. And essentially what we're looking at is obviously if you're short, you want seller control. If you're long, you want buyer control. Okay. Essentially, when you get into a trade, the minute that you execute, you're going to have buyers come in and sellers come in, and buyers come in and sellers come in. And you're not going to get very far on either, on either edge, and that's really what this first zone is about. It's just about getting a sense for how many buyers or sellers are with you or against you. Okay. Right from my execution, am I already kind of in the, in the green if I'm long? Am I... You know, am I starting to see a little bit of control? Well, good. That's great. That's what I want to see. But what I really want to see is that the buyers have started taking charge of this and are outweighing the sellers. So think of it as on balance volume put into a scale for you. Okay? We're just simply looking at the buyers coming in versus the sellers coming in. And, of course, we're assuming, we're, we're making an assumption here that volume executed at the ask is buyers, volume executed at the bid is sellers. Okay? So you, you have to, yeah, you have to make that concession or else this is going to make your head spin, okay? We don't know for sure that they're all new positions. We don't know that it's not some closing, you know, a short that then uh, buys to, go to, to get flat. Um, but what we're assuming is that the way that, the, that that concession is being made in price is indicative of the more aggressive trader. And obviously, we can see it on both sides across the scale. Now, when something gets into an overwhelming control, state of control, listen, if I'm long and, and I have a little bit of buyer control and it moves into the second or third zone 
and then all of a sudden I start getting hammered back, and I don't mean that my pri the price starts dropping back to entry. I mean that, I, that sellers are overwhelmingly coming in. Maybe I'm two or three ticks into, a, into profit, and this thing is screaming red at me. What do you think I should do? Should I be happy with a few ticks of, of profit and walk away and get ready for the next trade? Or should I say, ah, I'm not going to pay attention to that? Forget it. No. Take the profit, guys. It's telling you what's going on, and you, you should pay attention to it. And is it going to be right 100% of the time? No. No, because conditions change. Okay? So this is a tool that you can use with your charts, with the commitment of traders. You can use this as you're in a trade to get a sense of how good of a job you're doing. You know? Is this really working? Are the buyers really still coming in? Because once I'm in a trade, it's very hard for me to look at a period and associate everything that goes on within that. Right? But if I look at this, I can get a solid count and know where I am, and I can follow the percent gain that I'm retaining, and I can see who's in control. And if I get into a trade and I'm profitable, and then the, the tracker's telling me that I'm about to get hammered, I'm going to get out. You know, I might as well. And that happened to me, uh, was that this morning or yesterday morning? Now I'm clueless. This morning. What do you mean when the dome gets cluttered with too much volume? Yeah, they're all running together, Lev. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, we were in a long, and what I saw was was that we had traded volume at the ask, at the low, and then, oh, you know, all of a sudden uh, we're back on top of it, two ticks profit, and the sellers come in and start hammering me. I took the profit. Was it the right thing to do for me? Yes. Did it pay as much as it should? No. Okay, well, the dome getting cluttered with too much volume and no rotation for three hours have to be two totally different things. Don't mistake what, a, what your depth of market is. Depth of market is on your order entry. In your case, I know that is a, um, uh, uh, Infinity AT. Okay, That's where your depth of market is shown. It's not shown on your uh, order flow analyzer. correlates with volume SR. I don't think I'm understanding, Mike. Sorry. Okay, well, you'll have you'll have to use this in combination with everything that you know. Okay? Not one thing is here is going to make you profitable on its own. All of this works as a symphony. Okay? I'm, it's just like having uh, a responsive buying pattern and needing the commitment of traders to be there and needing that to correlate with some level of support. Okay? If you have the trade tracker telling you that the sellers are banging up against you but you're confident because you're up against a support level, then you best watch the, the chart and make sure that your condition remains the same. Correct? We're running really long here, guys, so I'm going to move on to the next thing, and we can do questions afterwards, okay? All right, so a very basic strategy to get you guys started. And again, I don't expect that you're laying on, on real money trades yet. You know, I think it, in my book it would be foolish to do so. And I apologize if I'm calling anybody foolish, but you know, you're just learning this, so let's give it a little room to breathe. Okay, but it, as you begin your approach of this, I want you to focus on a, on a concept here that involves your edge in the market by reading the order flow. I'm a big believer in having an edge. All right? If I don't have an edge, what am I doing trading? And if I have an edge, I want to beat that edge to death. Okay? I want to use it to my advantage. I want to use it and I want to take advantage of it every single time. Okay? So our advantage by understanding how 
volume comes into the market and how people get trapped, whether it's, in this case, a responsive selling effort or buyers initiating trade or sellers initiating trade or responsive buying. Okay. The premise of it is that somebody's profitable and somebody's not, and we ought to know more or less how far the market is, is likely to go without much effort. Okay. Now today we talked a lot about understanding where previous trade was initiated and being able to draw targets from that. But most importantly, we ought to understand that a lot of times, particularly when the market's moving quickly, because we've all been there, we've all been the guy who buys at the high and then the market pulls back two points, stops us out, and then shoots up another 20. At least I have. I've been that guy. Right? Or girl. I haven't been that girl, but there's a few ladies in here today. All right. So what I want to do is take advantage of the fact that I know that the market's going to move a small bit. We're going to create that small rotation just by having an imbalance in volume. And when we get too many buyers upside down, we're going to rotate back a couple of points. Right? I know we're going to. So by engaging the market at the best possible entry and accepting the risk of a few ticks to do so, I know that I ought to be able to get the market to move me into a profitable trade fairly quickly. Okay. But after that, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have a clue. I mean, I want it to go in the direction of my trade, but I don't really know. The only thing I know is that once we pull all the stops out of the market, then we have the opportunity to either run it in the same direction or for more shorts to come in and reverse the market. Okay? And I don't know what's going to happen, and I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I do. The reason that I don't trade indicators that put me into trades two points off the low is because 50% of the time they don't work. Why? Well, we, we went through this. We had our aha moment earlier, right? That's where trade's going to run into a jam. And so if I can take advantage of being able to spot a target or using something like a two points from where the bulk of trade's stuck okay, and taking a portion of my position off, then I can set myself up for a break-even trade if it doesn't work out. Okay? I can use a smaller stop or you know, and get, still give myself room to breathe because think of it this way. If I go and I, and I take a... I put on a trade and I use a one-and-a-half point stop. Okay? I use a one-and-a-half point stop and then I let the market move in my favor one point and I take half of my position off. Let's say I'm a two-lot trader. Okay. Oops. So I get in, I've got a fairly big stop, and I've got like a four tick profit. Okay, and I've got two lots, and I take one here, I'm at plus one. If I move this to four ticks and I get stopped out, that's minus one. Okay, so that equals zero. Okay, well I didn't make anything on the trade, but what have I given myself? Because a minute ago I had a one-point buffer, but I've just given myself a two-point buffer to manage a trade, haven't I? And my objective is I better have a larger target or this never made sense to start with. Now I understand what goes through your head immediately. You're risking twice as much to make half. If I get stopped out with two contracts here, it's going to cost me X, and I'm only taking profit here. And look, this is not a long-term strategy for you. All right? You're going to figure out how to blend this into your own risk to reward, which is what we're going to talk about on Friday. We have to have a plan and a strategy, and somebody who's got a $2,000 trading account is not in the same boat as somebody who has a $50,000 trading account. Okay? Can't take the same trades, can't take the same risk, can't trade the same number of contracts. But you can use the exact same process. Okay? And so as we're getting you started in this, and you're trading on a simulator, and you're starting to test your comprehension, the reason I want you doing this is because if you don't, if you choose to be the guy who says I'm going to use a uh, five tick stop, and as soon as I get uh, one point, then I'm going to move my stop to entry, 
you'll never be able to let a trade develop. Okay? And learning to trade is learning to manage. All right? You have to learn how to manage trades. And in order to do that, when we start out, we've got to have a little room to breathe. It can't be the end of the world if it down ticks two ticks. Okay? It just can't. We have to have a little bit of room. You have to start to learn how this works. And the reason is, is because in this two-point period, or this two-point range that we give ourselves, we can see this turn into responsive selling, sellers initiating trade. We can see it turn into responsive buying, where we get out of the trade. We can see a lot develop in two points. We can't see anything develop in three ticks. Okay? So what we want to do is use the advantage that this strategy gives us. And when I say strategy in that context, I mean trading the order flow and looking for the imbalance. Okay? The advantage it gives us is that the market should move about six to eight ticks from where the bulk of volume is. And it's not going to do it every time, and we've seen some really slow rotations. But for the most part, that's going to be the reaction. Okay? And the reason for that, the reason we're so blessed with this market is because we have so many undercapitalized traders in this thing, it's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous to me how many people approach this market with nothing. And they're not willing to take anything on a drawdown. And so it's like, well, i got to win 100% of the time. Well, I'm happy to take their money. Okay? And if you've been that guy before, the reason you're here is to not ever be that guy again. So let's focus on the fact that people like that facilitate our trade. They're the ones that pay us every single day. So I want to take advantage of that. Okay? And then I can learn how to manage a trade that I'm actually in and not one that I'm passively saying, yeah, well, if I was in that, I'd do this. Yeah, who cares? You're not going to learn anything until you've got something at risk. All right? Because what I want you focused on is the fact that once you learn how to read this and you learn how to manage, it's not difficult to make an awful lot of money trading a couple of times a day, looking for the right setup, looking for the right opportunity, and take a, a few trades a day and take them all before 10 o'clock in the morning. And then go do something that you really love. Okay? The reason that you became a trader is not because you wanted to sit in front of a computer all day long. That's At least if, it, it, if that is, I don't know that we need to hang out together. Okay? Most people became traders because they want a better quality of life. They hate their boss. They hate the corporate world. They hate all that. They're fascinated by markets. They're fascinated by the concepts. Whatever it may be, at the end of that, it's usually because I love to go fishing or I love my grandkids or I want to spend more time with my family or, you know, whatever it is. Okay? So put that into the context of saying, all right, I want a steady heart rate. I don't want to run myself into the ground. I want to... Uh, be able to to take some trades and not feel like I'm strung out the entire time. And I want to be able to do that a few times a day when the opportunity is just ideal for me. And I want to wrap that up in the morning so that I can go play golf or go over to my kid's house or whatever it is. You know, That's what it's all about. That's why you're here. And if you've never had the consistency to do that, I'm going to recommend that you, you know, work with us here. Give us a little room to help you because you'll find the consistency very good. Now, is this something that's going to work long term for you to trade two contracts and consistently, you know, be be wrestling like this? No. But it's a place for you to start so that you can understand how to how to really move forward with this. You might find yourself like about maybe 30% of the traders in here who are constantly looking for uh just capitalizing on this with very very small stops and they take half a point to three quarters of a point, sometimes one point, and they do that five or six times a day and they're done. Because it's easy to do. Or you might be more like me where you say, I would like to, to trade two, three, maybe four times where I get a decent trade off and I get to manage it and I get to have that be for a runner and I end up you know, doing the same thing as this but without risking more than I'm making six times in a row. Right. Just a couple of different ways to approach it. All right, so tomorrow we're going to get away from the order flow. We've got to get away from this for a little bit. By the end of today, and the more that you absorb this, I think that you should have a very good concept of all the numbers and stuff that we're looking at. 
right? So we got to step away from that and start to show you how to tie this into a bigger picture thing because I'm interested in where commercial traders are trading, people that are bigger than me. I want to trade with them, not against them. Okay? So we need to learn about market phase transitions, where to trade, where not to trade. I'm going to introduce you to volume distribution. By no means a course in volume profile. You don't have to use it. I like to introduce you to it because I think it correlates very well with what we do. We're going to talk about range analysis. Okay, What's probable? How do we, how do we come up with this every day? How do we know what we should be looking for? And we'll discuss the algorithmic pivots. So good day three. I hope everybody got a lot out of that. Please let me know if you've got questions.